Hello, my name is Carl Dice-Roth. I'm a professor of bioengineering and psychiatry at Stanford and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And today I'd like to tell you a little bit about optogenetics, uh, some of the humble origins of this uh, method in science, uh, some of its applications, and uh, some of the interesting lessons that it teaches us about the uh, process of biology. Now, I'm also a, a psychiatrist, and a lot of the inspiration for this technology came from psychiatry. And although this is an important uh, field of medicine, uh, it's uh, got a long way to go. Uh, in many ways, we haven't progressed too far in our basic description of the core symptoms uh, and their underpinnings, their causal underpinnings, than we had uh, hundreds of years ago. Here's a depiction of some of the earliest medical model type uh, descriptions of depression and this uh, symptom that today we call anhedonia, the inability to enjoy uh, normally rewarding uh, things. And John Hoslem in uh, the early 1800s described in melancholy what we would call depression today. They therefore neglect those objects and pursuits which formerly prove sources of delight and instruction. And this is about as precise as we can be today about what anhedonia really is uh, in, uh, in psychiatry. And what's a really amazing part of the story is uh, microbial organisms, uh, single-celled uh, uh, forms of life, have given us tools that in the last few years have allowed us to come to a, a deeper understanding of uh, this fundamental and important medical and scientific uh, question and many others like it. Now, uh, this uh, also gives an opportunity to, to take a broader view about what is optogenetics, where does it stand in uh, the broader context of, of interventions, of experiments that we can do in, in neuroscience. And in the brain, which as we all know is, is a, a very complicated uh, 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 system with many uh, interconnecting parts, we have historically had the ability to use either magnetic or electrical interventions to stimulate uh, neurons. But one problem is that they cannot discriminate individual kinds of neurons that may be right next to each other. They all look the same to an electrical or a magnetic intervention. Uh, what optogenetics allows us to do is to put uh, particular sensitizers, antennas of a, of a sort, uh, for external sources of energy information into specific kinds of neurons. And then we can use light, in this case, if we make light sensitive uh, 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 antennas or transducers and make neurons of a particular kind respond uh, to light. And we do that to allow different kinds of ions to flow into cells and turn neurons on or off depending on the experiment. That's the fundamental idea of optogenetics. And it's something people have wanted to do for a very long time. The first person who seemed to have uh, framed the, the possible solution uh, to this uh, age-old question was Francis Crick. In uh, 1999, he described the essence of this problem that we needed to control, turn on or off individual kinds of cells, and he suggested the ideal signal would be uh, light. He didn't have an idea of how to do it, but in his usual perceptive fashion, he uh, had uh, some pretty good uh, instincts, I would say. And what I'd like to do here is to, uh, to sort of pay homage to the many people who have thought about this and done experiments and, uh, and contributed, uh, both historically and up to the present, in uh, making all of this uh, ultimately work. Now. Uh, there were uh, early efforts uh, dating back to 2002. Uh, a pioneer in this field, Gero Miesenbach, was able to take uh, individual components uh, from a metazoan eye, the multicellular organisms. Uh, we all know, of course, we have light-sensitive cells in our retinas. And they achieve light sensitivity with a cascade of proteins. And he was able to get to the point where he could bring some of those individual components of that cascade uh, together and confer light sensitivity on neurons. And the bright areas of this plot are where the light was on. Uh, and there were other uh, groups who also took uh, what you might call a multi-component uh, approach to try to make neurons light sensitive. Now, the only thing that held back these uh, elegant methods was, in many ways, their multi-componency, which contributed to difficulties in targeting. Uh, and they, of course, would be the uh, first to state and, in fact, showed beautifully that there was some uh, delay in the onset of the responsivity, the action potentials that were fired by the cells uh, in response to the light. And what uh, allowed this uh, field to take off was the microbial approach, as I alluded to earlier. Now, these microbial organisms, they're small, 
They uh, don't have a lot of space to work with, nor do they have to do as complex processing as other organisms do. And so they had the leeway, evolutionarily it seems, to make very efficient, uh, all-in-one, single component uh, systems for both detecting light and generating ion flow. And that allowed the generalizable uh, aspect of this solution to happen. And this is a field that has its roots back, uh, even as far back as the early 1970s. Uh, Dieter Osterhelt and Walter Stachinius in 1971 identified bacteria rhodopsin uh, and uh, over decades, they and a thriving community of researchers uh, 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 were able to sort out how this uh, amazing protein works, how it responds to light, uh, how its photocycle of the individual protein allows uh, ions to be transported across the membrane. And this uh, pump-type class of microbial opsins, uh, bacteriodopsin being an example, was followed by discovery of the halorhodopsins, where instead of protons being moved, chloride ions are moved instead. Uh, Peter Hegemann and his colleagues, uh, beginning uh, with some early uh, predictive work in 1985, leading to a, a, a very important paper in 2002, showed that there were also channel-type microbial opsins that opened uh, actual pores in the membrane instead of pumping one ion at a time. Uh, and then uh, many groups uh, here, uh, Fang Zhang in my laboratory was able to find a, a red light activated uh, channel rhodopsin in 2008, and a great number of different groups. Uh, Fang Zhang, Peter Hegemann, our colleague, uh, Ed Boyden, Gerard Nagel, Ernst Spanberg, John Spudich, and many others have been identifying uh, amazing, amazingly diverse uh, 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 microbial opsins with different properties uh, from across the phylogenetic spectrum. Now, uh, what is striking, as you'll notice from this, is how long we've known about these. And uh, this happens to be my uh, biochemistry textbook, the, a beautiful book written by Lubert Stryer in, in 1988. This was the version I, I used, and, and you can see this is textbook uh, type knowledge, uh, description of the photocycle of bacteriodopsin, for example, uh, uh, part of the foundational knowledge of biochemists and neurobiologists. Now, there were people who did uh, try to put these uh, microbial opsins in different settings, in fact, successfully. This is a very interesting paper from 1994 uh, where the bacteriodopsin was indeed uh, uh, transferred uh, along with light-sensitive uh, flow of ions uh, into a, a eukaryotic uh, uh, organism. So, uh, but uh, nobody had yet tried to actually uh, create uh, a tool for neurobiology to turn on or turn off individual kinds of cells. Neurons are complicated, they're vulnerable, they're sensitive, they're different, but uh, in principle it was an experiment that uh, could be done, and uh, there were indeed many people trying to do it. Now, uh, the path uh, to this uh, in my own lab uh, started uh, uh, very near to the time when I uh, had uh, started setting up my uh, independent laboratory, and I had a, a, a very humble approach uh, where, uh, as you can see, I used very simple uh, tallies to assess uh, how the experiments were uh, working. And it's interesting to look back on the, the simplicity of this early experiment. But what I was doing here, uh, I had uh, uh, a broader view in the lab to try different kinds of proteins uh, to see if we could turn neurons on or off with different kinds of uh, stimuli. Uh, I had acquired the channel rhodopsin gene. I'd written to a group in Germany that had uh, worked on the initial clone from Gerard Nagel, and he sent me the clone right away, which was uh, very generous of him. I was also looking at different kinds of potassium channels to see if we could turn neurons on or off, constitutively active or dominant negative potassium channels. And I uh, was putting all of these uh, into separate groups of uh, uh, neurons in culture uh, to see if I could get control over their activity level. And I was using a very uh, simple, straightforward uh, readout of membrane depolarization, the phosphorylation of a transcription factor uh, called CREB, which I had done a lot of work on uh, previously. And the uh, amazing result was that uh, in these uh, neurons, you can see by the red stain in the nucleus of the cell and a stimulated uh, compared to a, an unstimulated neuron, both of these were expressing the channel rhodopsin uh, coupled to a yellow fluorescent protein. So I could see a number of things here. I could see that the gene that I'd put in was being expressed. It was being uh, transported to the membrane, that the neuron was healthy. It hadn't exploded as a result of putting this high levels of this membrane protein into the cell, uh, which uh, uh, can happen, to be sure. And moreover, that the light-activated, uh, the light-treated uh, uh, neuron uh, 
revealed that it had been uh, stimulated. This membrane had been uh, depolarized. A calcium flux had uh, occurred, and, a, and this biochemical readout uh, was telling us that this was happening. And in neurons that were expressing a lot of the channel rhodopsin, uh, uh, I could see a big difference uh, in the number of cells that were uh, uh, reporting on this uh, uh, depolarization event. And overall, it was statistically significant. Uh, 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 and although this was a very simple, uh, cheap Hummel experiment, this showed us that it was uh, possible. And this was in uh, early July of 2004, but things went very quickly uh, after that. This is what our uh, small group looked like at the time. You can see the uh, two grad students, uh, Feng Zhang and Ed Boyd in here, both now at MIT. Uh, Feng Zhang now also very well known for his work on uh, CRISPR-Cas9 systems. But we knew uh, that we had to do a lot more uh, than just show some uh, neurons getting stimulated. We had to show this was unique, that it was uh, potentially generalizable or versatile, that it could potentially be applied in broader systems. And there was rightly so a lot of skepticism at the time. Uh, but the students uh, uh, were, did some really uh, brilliant and creative work. Uh, Feng Zhang designed the viral systems that would allow us to uh, put the channel rhodopsin in a very versatile way into different uh, brain regions in vivo. And the fact that it's just a single gene allowed us to be confident that this would uh, work well. Uh, Ed did a number of beautiful recordings showing how uh, fast the responses could be, which was another important uh, feature of the system, both its potential generalizability and its speed. And uh, there were many other groups working on this uh, at the time, uh, Stefan Herlitzer, Zhohua Pan, uh, Yawo's group in Japan. Uh, but uh, we were able to uh, put the different pieces together uh, in time to, uh, to get the paper out. And it was published uh, together with the two students, Ed and Fung, as well as Gerrit Nagel and Ernst uh, Bamberg. And this, uh, though, uh, was, I wouldn't even say this was yet uh, fully optogenetics because there was a great deal more uh, work that needed to happen. It took about five more years of uh, very intense effort to show that we uh, had actually created something that was generalizable, useful, and broadly applicable, which was the key uh, goal. So optogenetics didn't start overnight. The experiments were uh, hum humble uh, and simple, uh, but it took a, a number of years to actually say we had uh, finally uh, discovered how to make this work. Part of the problem was how do you get light into uh, big mammalian brains? Um, and this is an early sketch of uh, Feng Zhang where he designed uh, the fiber optic uh, interface. And this was from 2006, but then this looks very much like how we now uh, do it today. So. Uh, you can see he's a, a good artist as, as well as a great scientist. And this fiber optic interface has since uh, allowed us to do many things, but I'll show you one other first uh, experiment. Uh, this was two years later in 2007. Uh, Feng uh, was working with some mice that we had made in collaboration with Guo Ping Feng and George Augustine. And these were mice uh, designed to have channel rhodopsin expressed in, uh, uh, in the brain. And what Feng did was he implanted uh, into uh, this mouse, a fiber optic on the right side of its brain, which, as you know, uh, will control movement toward or attention to the left side of the world. And uh, when he turned on the light, as you'll see here, the animal immediately starts moving and starts turning to the left. And this was the moment when I would say we uh, finally knew that we had made something that uh, was going to be broadly applicable, generalizable. Uh, and that was followed quickly by a collaborative uh, set of experiments with Luis de la Sea, uh, Alex Arabinis, Antoine Adamantidis, and others, where we applied this fiber optic interface to target a deep structure in the brain in the lateral hypothalamus. Uh, Fung designed some uh, promoters uh, that would fit into a lentivirus and allow us to control uh, just one kind of cell deep in the hypothalamus. And uh, in this work, we were able to play in certain kinds of activity and show some of the neural codes that were causal in sleep-wake uh, transitions. Uh, and then, it, even then, though, this required, you know, some, a very specific uh, fragment of a promoter, the hypocretin promoter, which would fit into a virus. And there was still, rightly so, some skepticism as to how broadly generalizable this would be. But between uh, 2009 and, and 2010, we uh, finally uh, were able to uh, show that there were a broad array of different tools you could use to generalizably target different kinds of cells. And by this point, I would say by 2010 or so, people uh, were able uh, to see that, that this could be applied uh, uh, to virtually any system. Uh, a good example of how that all worked was uh, in our studies of anxiety. 
Now, anxiety is uh, a normal part of life. It's a healthy part of life. Of course, it can become excessive and it can be uh, pathological in some cases. But what we were able to do uh, is to use optogenetics to play in patterns of activity or suppress patterns of activity in particular cells and projections uh, in and around structures relating to the uh, uh, basolateral amygdala and the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. And the way we did some of these experiments is we uh, injected a virus, an adeno-associated viral vector, into the structure of interest, the DNST, but then we were able to position our fiber optics in other downstream structures. And by doing so, we were able to recruit cells defined by having a particular projection pattern, which as you can see is a generalizable strategy. You don't need a special kind of animal or a special promoter. You just need to know your anatomy. And this works because the opsins are trafficked down the axons uh, of the cells, particularly if we help them out with little uh, trafficking motifs um, uh, that were discovered in the lab uh, uh, by Viviana Gradinaro and her colleagues. And I'll, go, I'll show you an example of how this sort of thing works. This is an experiment. I'll play this movie. Uh, Kay Tai in the lab did this uh, uh, work, which uh, was published in 2011. This uh, is a, what's called an elevated plus maze. Uh, the so-called closed uh, arm has these elevated walls. And you'll see uh, that the uh, animal prefers to spend its time in the closed uh, arm of the maze, very rarely venturing out into the uh, open arm, which uh, is like walking the plank for an animal. Uh, but in our studies of anxiety-related behaviors, uh, what we found and what Kay was able to show, and we followed this up with a, a, a great deal of other work, was that there were anti-anxiety pathways buried within the brain. Uh, when the blue letters come on here, you'll see when she started driving one of these, as we discovered, anti-anxiety pathways. And you'll see for the first time, the mouse is willing uh, to go out into the open arms and explore them which it never had been before. Nothing else changed about the animal, the speed, or anything else. It simply was willing uh, to accept this uh, risk. And this was instantaneously reversible. And this, of course, is only one feature of anxiety, apprehension in the absence of immediate threat. But there are other features, too. Respiratory rate changes, a subjective feeling. Uh, anxiety feels bad, and resolution of anxiety feels good. And in later work, we were able to show that different uh, projections coming from the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis uh, recruit different features of anxiety using this projection targeting approach where we position the fiber optic in a different location than the uh, uh, injection of the virus. And this sort of thing uh, allowed the generalizability of optogenetics to become uh, clear. And so uh, in this sort of work, uh, if you think back to those very early humble, humble experiments in culture, you can see it took a number of years to finally put all the pieces uh, together. I'm often asked what's the potential clinical impact of, of optogenetics. Uh, and although I'm a psychiatrist, I run a purely basic science laboratory. I'm not working on clinical translation in my lab. But it's a natural question to ask, and, and other people are working on it. Uh, the group of uh, Antonella Bonci found in 2013 that they could turn down cocaine-seeking behavior in rats with optogenetic stimulation of the medial prefrontal cortex, a very striking uh, result that they published in 2013. And that was then followed up uh, with uh, Antobanchi and uh, uh, some uh, clinical colleagues with a optogenetically guided clinical intervention. They used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can be non-invasively delivered to awake uh, uh, human beings. Of course, human brains are a lot bigger, but they have a lot of the same basic reward circuitry. And what they found was, guided by optogenetics, they were able to have a group of cocaine-addicted human beings no longer uh, seek cocaine. They had an experimental group and a control group, and they had a, a, a very powerful effect. This uh, sort of thing shows uh, how far we've come uh, that we can uh, directly affect uh, with a principled, guided uh, uh, approach these very powerful uh, and important uh, fundamental behaviors in human beings. And this makes, uh, of course, uh, coming back to the initial uh, inspiration uh, that, that we had starting to go down this path, uh, now we do uh, understand in a causal and precise fashion many of the cells and connections across the brain that do affect these uh, very important uh, and both basic and uh, disease-relevant behaviors. Now, this, uh, of course, had very uh, uh, humble beginnings, if you recall those, those initial tallies in the, in the lab notebook. And we've come a long way since then. But 
in a way, it's, it's even more striking when you think how, how these very simple organisms themselves uh, have created these, these tools that let us uh, make this progress. There's a whole other world uh, that has happened uh, as well uh, in terms of discovering how these basic microbial opsins work. Uh, we've been able to adjust the speed of the opsins, their sensitivity to light. We've been able to engineer them to conduct different kinds of ions to turn cells on or off guided by uh, getting to the crystal structure of one of these uh, uh, channel rhodopsins. And we can change the color that they respond to as well. This has allowed us to do something very important, which is to tune the amount and the timing of the activity that we play in to uh, precisely what's naturally occurring in the organism, even that same individual during a very well-defined uh, behavior. And so this... This uh, uh, elegance and precision of the method, again, is all the more striking when you think back to how crude and, and simple some of the early experiments were uh, and how long it took uh, to get the whole system uh, working. Uh, but in the end, that's what makes uh, biology fun and beautiful, uh, and I hope uh, to have conveyed some of that uh, uh, to you today. <laughs>